social media. Hi everyone in Facebook Live and in YouTube land and of course our dear friends here as always on Zoom. So tonight we're going to take a topic which was reinvigorated recently on Lagba Omer and that is the power and purpose of music and song. And there's so much to say on this. Really this is many many classes but I just want to get to the main points this evening of the power, the necessity of music when it comes to Jewish thought, Jewish life, Torah, connecting to God and actually connecting to our own neshamat, our own souls, because this whole music thing goes very, very deeply. And I want to share with you a, a statement of one of the great rabbis who says that music is actually a form of chokhmah, a form of wisdom. There is wisdom that we all understand and know, wisdom of uh, knowing things, understanding things, but there's something very unique about music. And music has the power to go much deeper and influence a person so much more than just a form of rational, verbal um, understanding. And that's going to be our topic tonight. And really, if you think about it, we, the Jewish people, like to sing. And we sing our prayers and we chant the Torah. The Torah isn't mere prose. We just read when the Bal Koran gets up to read from the Torah. He chants it and different communities have different melodies that come with the Torah reading. There's a reason why. Actually, we're going to see that Moshe Rabbeinu Moses referred to the entire Torah as a shira, as a song, as a song. Now, the word shira is a very interesting word, shir or shira. The rabbis tell us that the word shira is related to the word shura, which is a line, because music and song has the power to set us straight. That's why the word shir and shira and shur, a line, are connected. And a song is a zimra, le zamer. And that actually is related to the word to prune, of zomer, to prune away, because music has the power, say the Kabbalist, to prune away spiritual impurities, things that hold us back. And we're going to see that the power of music is so important. It's so enriched with wisdom. It accesses parts of the soul that words or ideas or even thoughts cannot reach. So that's going to be our topic this evening. Let's start with the first ever musician. That's a good trivia question. Who do we, the Jewish people, see as the first ever composer of music and song and chants, maybe not something we would recognize today, in Jewish history? Actually, we have to go back into world history. And the rabbis tell us that Adam, Adam, the first man, composed a song praising the beauty of Shabbat. And actually that song was recorded and edited by King David and put into Tehillim. Psalm 92 is actually a sheer, a song that Adam Harishon, Adam the first man, and Chava created and synthesized into a song of praise. And we're going to see that there is a strong connection between praising Hashem, having gratitude to God, and singing it, letting the harmony come from deep inside us. The Ibn Israel, one of the great commentators, says that music is what he calls a chokhmah gadola, a great wisdom. People who are endowed with the ability to make music, to create music, and if they have good voices, that's a bonus. I am unfortunately not one of those people. Mother, my mother and father made me take piano lessons. I didn't take it seriously. I wish I would have, but I used to play guitar at least and still do a little bit. But people who really have that chokhmah are accessing a part of their neshama. It's coming from a place that is not even understood rationally. There's something else about this chokhmah, about this wisdom. And the Ramban, Nachmanides, tells us that one of the ways to access your neshama, to trigger it, to awaken it, 
is through song. And we're going to see that's why that song was a major part and music were a major part of bringing sacrifices and the entire ceremonial aspect in the Beit HaMikdash in the temple in Jerusalem. Actually says the Gemara that a sacrifice that was brought without song is not a sacrifice, then it doesn't count. It's not a valid sacrifice. Every sacrifice that was brought to the Beit HaMikdash was brought with music and singing in the Levim. The Levites were the ones who would sing. There were 15 steps leading into the Beit HaMikdash and there would be 15 Levim that would sing 15 songs as the Jewish people would enter inside to lift up their spirits to prepare them for the incredible spiritual experience they were about to receive in the Beit HaMikdash, whether they were coming for a holiday, to bring a a, a sin sacrifice, whatever it was, they needed to be in a good mood. And there is a strong connection between true good mood and song. The two are deeply connected. And the Vilna Gaon says that really the secrets to all songs were revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. And every piece of music that's ever been created since then is just an amalgamation or somehow derived from those original songs that Moshe Rabbeinu heard on Mount Sinai. Who, you may be thinking, was singing songs when Moses went to Mount Sinai? The Jewish people weren't singing music. They were at the bottom of the mountain. So who exactly was singing songs that Moses heard? And actually Moses heard some of the lyrics too. And he liked them so much that he actually took them and he brought them down to us. And they were invested into our prayers. One of them you may have heard before. We actually whispered, except on Yom Kippur. Baruch Shem Kavod Marotol Yolam Ve'ed. This was a song that Moshe Rabbeinu heard the angels singing on Mount Sinai and he liked it so much that he said, I want to bring that song as a gift down to the Jewish people. The lyrics at least, maybe not the, ha- the um, harmony that came with it. I, I want to quote for you, uh, if I may, a beautiful idea, which I heard from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And I'm just going to quote this for you because it doesn't do justice not to. And he says that there is an inner connection between music and the spirit, the neshama. You see, when language, he says, aspires to the transcendent and the song longs to break free of the gravitational pull of the earth, it modulates into song. Song is the mechanism that your soul can literally be set free. Music, said Arnold Bennett, is a language which the soul alone understands, but the soul cannot translate. Maybe, by the way, this is the reason that in the Torah, we only see letters, but the cantillation marks are not there because they're so powerful and they're so high, they cannot be recorded in the Torah and they have to be learnt, but they are invisible. It is in Richter's words, the poetry of the air, he says, is music. What a beautiful expression. Tolstoy called music and song the shorthand of emotion. Goethe said religious worship cannot do without music. It is one of the foremost means, he says, to work upon man with an effort of marvel. Words are the language of the mind. Music is the language of the neshama, of the soul. What an incredible, what a beautiful and incredible understanding of what music is. But it goes very deep. Let's go into another realm of depth when it comes to music and song. And by the way, we'll see, this is one of the reasons that when we want to put our babies to sleep, we usually rock them, which gives them the feeling of being maybe in the womb, but all that familiar feeling. But we also sing lullabies. Why do we all, at some point, everyone's got children or grandchildren, right? We'll sing lullabies and songs to babies as we rock them to sleep or try to soothe them? The answer to this question is extremely deep and so, so powerful. You see, before the soul, before your soul was placed inside your body, it was housed somewhere. This music, as we said, is the language of the soul. It's the way the soul expresses itself. 
and music through prayer is seen as the highest level of music which connects us to God. But before we came to this world, my friends, our souls were stored in a special place. And that place, say the rabbis, was actually with, with the angels. The malachim, the angels were accompanying our souls before they were placed inside our bodies. And music is the way angels communicate. Isn't that beautiful? A very deep Kabbalistic idea that many Jewish sources talk about. The angels will sing shira, sing songs every day, all day. And before our souls were in this world, on a shamat, they were with those angels. Say the rabbi something unbelievable. When you rock a baby to sleep, what you're actually doing is reminding that baby of the source of that soul, of that neshama. So we sing to babies so that they are able to connect to their original neshamot and the original angelic, angelic songs they heard before they entered into their bodies. That, say the Kabbalists, is actually the reason we sing songs to babies because we know deep down that they connect a song because it reminds them of what life was like before they entered into this physical realm. What a beautiful idea. Now, harmony is a big part of this. You know, we humans, as I've mentioned before, are pleasure seekers. We love pleasure. The food we eat, the vacations we go on, the relationships we try to build, we're all about pleasure, receiving pleasure, maybe giving pleasure to other people as well. That's really what we want to do. That is our essence of who we are. But what exactly is pleasure? What makes a pleasure pleasurable? What makes that pizza so good? What makes that music, that song we hear, that can take us to the highest heights, what makes it so powerful? And the answer actually is harmony. The food we eat has to harmonize, has to have the right ingredients, right? If you're eating a, a pizza, you want the right amount of cheese, the right amount of dough, the right amount of sauce, and the sauce has to have the right amount of salt and spices inside it, and the sunset and the piece of art we look at, we want to receive pleasure from looking at that art. And it's gonna have the right colors, the right shades, as it all combines to make a beautiful art or that rainbow or maybe the sunset. It just harmonizes. Music has the ultimate power to harmonize us, to give us harmony of self. And what we're really talking about is harmonizing our souls. So although music is accessed, through our ears, through the drums inside our inner ear. Really, every time we listen to music, it has the power for good or bad, because not all music is good, has the power to impact our souls. Actually, the Kabbalists say that all music somehow is good. Lyrics aren't always good. Right? The, the wording of the Kabbalists, I've said to in Hebrew, they say that the, the music is not mekabal tuma doesn't have spiritual impurity attached to it. When bad lyrics, words are added, then it can corrupt the music and the song entirely. So not all songs are worth listening to or playing to our children or dancing to. But if you have the right music with the great lyrics, you have a synthesis and a harmony that can affect our souls. We'll see actually that music has a lot to do with the highest level of spirituality a person can achieve. And that actually is prophecy. We know that there is a strong connection between Navua prophecy, receiving the word of God in a prophetic vision and music. And it goes right back. We know that Jacob, Yaakov, when he was mourning over the loss of his son, or what he thought, was the loss of his son Joseph, he went into a depressed state. And in that depressed state, he lost his prophecy. For the entire time, he was separated from his son Joseph. So Jacob and Joseph, during the time they were separated, Jacob was so upset, he lost his prophecy. How does a person capture prophecy? Well, it's extraordinary because it's mentioned explicitly in Tanakh, in scriptures. We know, for example, that when King David wanted to cheer up 
King Saul, because King Saul had a certain depression that used to come over. He was a very, very great man, but he went into a certain depression. And we see a number of times in scriptures, in Tanakh, in the Torah, where King Saul called out and said, bring me the great musician, David. He wasn't a king at that point. Bring me David. And David would come with his kinor, with his harp. And he would play music for King Saul. And King Saul would be lifted out of his depression, at least momentarily, when that music was being played. And he felt connected. Actually, King Saul became a prophet the first time, we're told, in scriptures, when he was walking around one day. And there were a band of musicians who were approaching him. And while he was merely passing these musicians, listening to their songs and their music being played, suddenly he jumped into a state of nouveau prophecy and he reached the highest level of spiritual connection and focus, say the rabbis, at that one point, and he remained a prophet from then on. His initial trigger to prophecy, which we already said, is the highest level of spirituality that a person can reach was nouveau prophecy, was when he heard music. And that music triggered in his soul, his neshama, something that he became a prophet from then on. And actually King David himself realized the power and the skill that he had of music. And many of you may know that the symbol of King David, you may have seen um, um, images of this when you walk around Jerusalem, the city of David, of King David with a crown on, playing a harp. Because the harp wasn't just there as a means of him to play music. It wasn't a hobby. Actually, we're told that King David used to take this harp. He would position it in his window that was open at nighttime. And somehow he knew the secrets of music. And as the wind would come in, it would blow against the strings, just like those wind chimes outside our doors. We do the same kind of thing. And the wind would come in and would somehow reverberate against the string of his harp. And he would hear this music and he would be uplifted. And whenever he was depressed, he played music to lift up his soul. And he used it as a way to receive prophecy from God and connect to God himself. And so we know that deep down, every person wants to connect to God. And there are various ways to do it. We pray when we talk to God, although many times we chant and sing our prayers. And we learn Torah to rationalize and to understand God. But if you want your soul to connect to God the fastest and most direct way, you listen to music. The right music, as we said, not all music is the same. Definitely the tunes and the melodies that come from music have that power. And actually all of Jerusalem, because of King David, you could hear music coming out of the temple in Jerusalem. The music that was heard over there had some power to lift people up from the lowest lows and bring them. And that's why the Rambam Mabonidi says in Shemona Barakim that if somebody feels depressed, they should listen to music. Music has the ultimate power to lift us up. Actually, the rabbis say even more. From the time of the Beit HaMikdash, the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, real uplifting music was taken away. What we have today are little shards, little um, elements of music. But after the temple was destroyed, the real beautiful power of music isn't really with us. And actually, according to some commentators, it's actually forbidden to listen to music all the time. We don't hold by this, and the Jewish people have accepted that music is an integral part of our connecting to God. But actually, to this day, there are certain times of the year where we're meant to feel mournful, like during the three weeks between the fast of Tammuz and Tisha B'Av. We have to feel a little bit depressed so we don't listen to music. And during the Omer, because of the great tragedy that happened to Rabbi Kiva's students, we don't listen to music, at least in live music. If a person's depressed, they need to listen to recorded music. That's understandable and that's acceptable. But make no qualms about it, my friends. Music has that tremendous power to lift us up. And actually, if you look in Jewish history, there were actually 10 songs, 10 songs that the Jewish people sang right 
through history that are recorded in the Torah. Not only that, there is something called Perak Shira. At any given moment, there are even songs that we don't even hear. And they record in a book called Perak Shira, the chapters of song. There are 85 of them. And in this book, which has become a custom now for many people to read, it actually tells us the songs of various elements of creation, of the stars and the moon and the earth and various animals that exist in this world. What does that mean? We can't even hear these songs. But what the rabbis are telling us is that there is a inherent harmony that is constantly being sung throughout creation. And sometimes we're able to hear it and sometimes we're not. But if we attune ourselves and we're able to just quiet things down, there's even a song that is constantly a sound that is constantly being played from the various parts of creation, the animals and even the earth itself say the rabbis, is giving off a certain musical quality at all times. And maybe that's one of the reasons that the entire Torah is called a shira. It's called a song. And that's why we mentioned already that when we read the Torah and Shabbat, we don't just read it as prose, we sing it, we chant it. It accesses parts of our souls and of course, we want the Torah to enter into us, not just to be a, a, an auditory, rational experience. We want it to be an emotional, a psychological, and a spiritual experience. And once you attach song to it, it becomes that way. One of the greatest songs in Jewish history that we actually have a custom to sing every single day in our tefillot is called Az Yashir. Az Yashir is a song that the Jewish people sang somehow in complete unison. And the rabbis marvel at this, that after the Jewish people went through the Red Sea and we were saved from the evil intentions of Pharaoh and his army, we sang a song. How do we all sing the same song when we didn't rehearse it? And the rabbis say that instilled into every single soul of every Jew at that time was a prophecy that was known as the prophecy of song of music, and somehow the entire Jewish people in unison were able to sing the song Az Yashir. And there's different tunes even today that people will, will sing to that particular song, Az Yashir Moshe, Az Yashir Moshe. And we sing this song to this very, very day. You know what's very, very interesting, by the way? The word Az, that the word Az means sometime in the future. Sometime in the future, Az Yashir. What, what, what do you mean, Az Yashir? We sang that song in the past, right? 3,333 years ago. What does that mean, sometime in the future? And the rabbis say something very, very important. There are no, nine songs that appear in all of scriptures. Az Yashir is, is one of them. What's interesting is that there's a tenth song. And that 10th song hasn't been composed yet, but it will be. Who's going to compose that song? And when are we going to sing that song? And that is the song of Mashiach, of the Messiah. And when the Jewish people enter into the land of Israel in unison, and even the Jews who are there presently right now, the first reaction we're going to have to the feeling of completion is song. Because song is also a sign of gratitude, of identity, of ultimate soul connection. So Az Yashir means that Moses and the Jewish people sang a song then, but there's a hint, Az, in the future, there's going to be a deeper and more powerful song. I'll go a little bit further with this. We know that there are uh, seven notes in a musical scale, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. And it goes, da, na, 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 right? And then it goes back to one again. You finish the scale, if I remember from my piano lessons of many years ago. But you get to seven, 
And then you get back to one again, you go one octave up, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. The rabbis say that there's going to be an eighth octave that's going to be added. There's even a change in the nature of music that we are going to achieve when the Messiah comes. So right now, the, the notes go from one through seven and then back to one again. But when the Messiah comes, there's going to be a change in creation. Somehow we're going to be able to access something that is not accessible right now. And that's a higher note, another string, an eighth string it's called, of the Messiah that we're going somehow to be able to hear. There's going to be a change that we're going to be able to hear a song that up to this point we have not been able to hear. Somehow it's there right now, but we're going to be able to access a new form of music at that time, which is going to elevate our souls to even higher level. And it makes sense because we know that the prophet Joel tells us that God is going to create a lot more prophecy. Actually, Eshpochaz Ruchiel Kolada. God is going to make every single Jew prophets at that time. And one of the ways, seemingly, that this is going to happen is by instilling in our souls some music that is not present within us right now. And that's going to coincide with the arrival of the Messiah, with the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, and of course, the rebuilding of the third and final Beit HaMikdash, which for sure, for sure, is going to create a whole new connection to songs and music. You think you enjoy music right now and you think right now that music lifts you up out of depression, which it should do, and that's its primary purpose of connecting you to a higher state, even to a potential state of prophecy. Wait till the future. Az Yashir, then, then we're going to hear songs and hear music that you never fathomed you could ever listen to. And that's why it says in the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu, Kitvu Lachem et Shira. Write down, write down this Shira. Write the following song down. Because the Torah, according to the commentators, should not be read, as we said, as prose. It should be read as poetry. Poetry with music attached. And you can't see the music. I know we write down musical notes, but that's not the kind of music. The Torah is telling us, I'm going to show you the letters. But above every letter, above, there is a note which you can't see. But in the future, that note somehow is going to become visible to you. And actually we know that God at Mount Sinai gave Moses the ability to access levels of music that no one had ever achieved before. And when Moses heard the angels singing, it lifted us up, but actually we're told that music even has the power to revive the dead. Because even after the Messiah comes, we have something called Tchiat HaMeitim, the revivication, the, the resurrection of the dead in the ground. And we're told that that connection of awakening the soul doesn't just awaken your soul now, but it even has the power to awaken the souls that aren't even alive. And God may have used that at Mount Sinai and may use it again in the future to awaken souls at the end of days. And so song and music, as we said already, is the language of the neshama. It is the purest and most direct way that a person's soul can connect and can almost outstep its physical boundaries as the body. Just like angels are not limited by bodies and spend the entire day singing, so too we have the power to break out of the physical bounds that hold us down with music. And anyone who listens to music and enjoys music or plays music knows exactly what I'm talking about. How to access a part of your soul that nothing else can access with music, and that is the right thing, with the right melodies and the right songs. I know my daughters and my son always walk around the house, always play music, and I'll tell you what they also do. And this is a tradition in many families. I've never seen it written anywhere, but I'm sure there's something to this. On Erev Shabbat, on er actually, 
Adam did it. Adam wrote a song in praise of Shabbat, right, which he must have done on realizing the power of Shabbat. We have a custom in our home, my daughters do anyway, to play Jewish music, Erev Shabbat. What a beautiful way. What a beautiful way to welcome in the Shabbat. We do it in our synagogues, we sing together. But at home, while you're laying the table or getting ready, it can be a very stressful time, right? Everyone's in the shower, everyone's running around, Shabbat's coming, put away the muksa, and everyone's very, very busy. But when you put music on in the background, suddenly the whole experience is enriched. The right music, the right music. There's lots of great Jewish music that is out there today, thank goodness. And so to welcome in Shabbat, to bring it in with guitar playing or play music in a stereo, whatever it is, it can definitely lift us up and take us to the highest, highest heights. That, my friends, is the power and purpose of music and song, to lift up our souls and to connect us to the highest heights here in the physical world. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook and Zoom. Wishing you all a wonderful, successful day tomorrow at 12 o'clock. I'll be here with a next part of our series of getting better at being you. So feel free to join us then. Thank you all. Have a great and beautiful night. And go listen to some music.